seeking worshipers to worship him in spirit and in truth. That's a given. It tells us, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. He is worthy of all praise. He is the Alpha, right? The Omega. He's our provider. He gives us all. He knows all our needs. He will bring out of us praise. That's his desire. But I was asking myself, what happens as we are making music? We, I say we should all be violins because if, it's my understanding that it's, there only can be one drummer. I mean, sure, there's exceptions to the rules, but um, I also understand that there can be up to 100, maybe plus violins, and they can fall in place. So I think if we're going to make music, let's all become violins. But my question as, as I was um, um, thinking in reference to the singing and the praises, w- what happens when you don't hear the music anymore? What happens when you don't hear a sound of joy? What happens? Because things do come to a conclusion. Change comes in a matter of seconds. Change can come as you're sitting here in the church. Well... I've seen change throughout my young years, 50 young years of life. I've seen a young lady go to, um, she was 16 years old. I've seen her, well, not seen her. This is a story that was relayed to us after um, I visited with her. This young lady was 16 years old. She went to Thanksgiving dinner. In that Thanksgiving dinner, she falls out. She, She falls on basically her head on the table. When she wakes up the next day, little did she know that she was going to wake up. 16 years old, a soccer player was going to wake up without one leg. Change happens when you least expect it. We recent has the recent loss of a, um, of, of a loved one. A 35-year-old wife of our niece that in one day, 35, two children, five years old, two years old, in one day, Healthy as it can be, smart as it can be, intelligent, well-educated, well-respected, well-liked, passed in one day. What happens when you no longer can hear the music? What happens when there's no reason to really praise in your heart? It says, truly says, in all things, praise the Lord. All things work for good. But when you're in the midst of that circumstance, the most difficult thing is to praise the Lord. What we should have in our DNA is trust. It's know that you know that although you cannot praise, although you can't shout, just go to the book of Samuel. We see the story of Hannah. Hannah could not say a word. So it is important for us to understand, please don't interpret someone else's silence. Silence doesn't necessarily mean that they're, they are disliking you. Silence means you're not listening to music come from them. But there's a great possibility that there may be some turmoil. Please don't ever interpret my silence. The Bible tells us to be still and know that I'm God. When you're still, you're still. You're silent. But God knows our every thought. He knows our every moves. He knows who we are. He knows our shortcomings. He knows our weaknesses. And in spite of it all, some of those circumstances produce in us some silence. But you know... There are strings sounding in the heavens because something is about to happen. And we see the story that, and I'm glad you read it because I couldn't make out the names. So I figured let me give them to you anyway so that you can help me with those names. So thank you. So Nehemiah gives his testimony. He speaks about his situation. He starts to say um, how his brother and some other brothers came down from, from Jerusalem. And he, he wanted to know the news about the people that were exiled, the people that were separated, his people. He had a concern. And as family, we should concern one from the other. Well, he got the news. Nehemiah received the news that the walls were crumbling and that the people were just 
unhappy. They were producing no music. And that brought sadness to him. What he did next is so very important. So very important. They said to me, this is what they told him. Those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and in disgrace. And disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burnt with fire. He says, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. Some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before God of heaven. I sat down and wept. It was a difficult moment. Not for him because he's in the king's palace. It was a sad moment because he's seen the condition of his people. It's important for us to realize where we are and sometimes we stand in a great place. But it's not necessarily our place. We need to look back and find out about our people. Where, whomever that may be and wherever that may be. So he went on to, to pray. His prayer, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we is Israelites, including myself, my father, my family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commandments, decrees, and laws you've given your servant Moses. He went before the Lord. The Bible tells us if we go before the Lord and humble ourselves, then... He will heal our land. And that's what he was in, 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 in dire need for. Before going to the king, he went into prayer. Before you go to your bosses, before you go to your superiors, before you go to those that are above you, especially in the working field, go to the Lord in prayer. Ask him. He supplies all our needs. He's a God of instant help in a time of trouble. Lean not unto your own understanding, right? Trust the Lord. So your circumstance is not bigger than God. God is bigger than your circumstance, no matter what it may be. But it also produced worship. For it said, Lord, the God of heavens, the great and awesome God. Recognizing how awesome God is should be the way we commence our Father. Matthew chapter 6 or chapter 7, one of the two. He said, the disciples asked, how, how do we pray? Our Father that thou in heaven, holy be thy name. It's acknowledging him. It's giving him glory. It's giving him honor for he deserves to be praised. He's worthy to be praised. And it seems as if that worship starts to open up and unlatch the windows of heaven. That's the key. There's one thing that we can, I won't say command from God. But what we can do is bring back to him what he told us he would do. For he's not man to lie. And we'll see that in this very next verse. Remember the instructions you gave. It's important. The instructions you gave. See, God is not man to lie. You said. You ever, your children, you know, you forget things. <laughs> Mom, you said. That you said. 
And it's usually when things are going against, you know, what, what their wishes are. And there's somehow we can't punish them for that because guess what? They're right. You say it. And it's okay. You're not contesting with God. You're just bringing to mind, to memory. See, God wants to hear from you. Didn't he tell Israel in many occasions while in the desert? Remember where I brought you from? So he wants you to bring to remembrance of the things he's said and the things he's done. Especially in those difficult times. When you find yourself ready to dig a hole and practically die or in a difficult situation, a trial and, and tribulation moment and a tempting situation, he's going to say, remember where I brought you from. And it seems like you come back to your senses. Are you following me or am I putting people to sleep here? Can, can you give God a, a, a clap offering? All right. So he's not a man to lie. So let's continue that. If you, servant was saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you along the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if you are exiled, people are at the farthest horizon. I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling place for my name. You say it. Lord, you said that if we scatter, and what he's bringing back to light is the present situation that they're in. They're scattered. So he says, you said, Lord, that you would bring us back. So now what, Lord? And I'm sure he said in a little, little, little scary moment, he said, Lord, you said. I'm kind of holding you accountable for what you said. You know, I'll be kind of careful how you bring it to, to remembrance. But nevertheless, God heard his prayer. The, the 10th verse says, they are still his prayer. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant. And to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was the cupbearer to the king. He gave him all, all this glory. You said, you said, your greatness. You said, you said, you did, you can, you will. Now I'm asking you for a favor. It's like buttering, you know, you ever, let's go back to our children. They butter you up. Then you turn around and say, what do you want? Because it seems like my daughter is the most happiest when she wants something. So she don't know that a telltale sign is her happiness. And usually when she finishes the, the, the comment or whatever she's doing in, in a graceful fashion, I usually end up asking the question, uh, what do you want? Am I right? How many experienced that before here? Is it just me? No, I didn't think so. So, all that, all that glory, which is an amazing thing. thing God, God wanted to hear all this, you know. But all he wanted is give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was a cupbearer. Now, cupbearers, what they would do is, before the king would drink the wine, I, didn't think, I don't think they had Pepsi back then, um, but he was a cupbearer, he would drink before the king, whatever it may be, in this case, wine. You could probably conceal some poison in there, am I right? Versus water, would probably taint the water. The wine, if someone was going to attempt to take the life of the king, it would probably be in the wine. So when the king, now this is his encounter, when the king looked at his countenance, when the king looked at his sadness, the king became frightened. Could it be that the king thought, hey, is somebody trying to kill me? 
Is it that he's dying because he just tasted from my wine? Is someone conspiring against me? So he asked them the question, what's wrong? There's something wrong with you. And that wrong was conflict of interest. That wrong, there's something wrong. It's not about him. He can die. He'll have a hundred more cupbearers. But his concern was there's someone conspiring to kill him. He was concerned about his life. Nehemiah was concerned now. I mean, it doesn't say it. It's unspoken. But could Nehemiah say, well, maybe he may think that I'm trying to poison him. I'm the last one with the cup. So it says he, he was frightened. But then he says something very interesting. He says something so, so interesting. May the king live forever. That was his defense. That's what actually probably saved his life. What he was saying is, king, hey, king, don't, don't you look at me in that way. I'm not trying to do you in. I can because I'm the last one with the cup. But guess what? I want you to live forever because I know that God has a plan with you. I know that you, king, are going to be used by God to serve my people. I know that my boss, that my teacher, that my neighbor that's getting on my nerves is there and designed with a plan from God. All we need to do is be still. Take the advice of Nehemiah. What he did was prayed. What he did was fasted. He went before the Lord with a plea. Because when we go before the Lord, things start to shift in such a way that it will produce in us, as Nehemiah did, it will produce in us worship. How many are following me so far? Amen. So, because of that prayer, that was the encounter. Because of that prayer, he asked, what is it then? What's making you sad? I was very much afraid. But I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad? When the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. The king responded, what is it that you want? It went from a concern. Possibility, the fear of life being threatened, his life being threatened, it turned around, it opened the door. It's, the next question is, was by the king, what is it that you want? He asked that question, but he went right back to step one before the king answered. Then I prayed to the God of heavens before he answered the king, to the king. Our response is sometimes, although they may seem right, doesn't necessarily mean that they're correct. We need to go back to the one we, we, we believe in. There was a conversation between two, but the overseer was God. He went back to God before Responding. It says, Then I prayed to the God of the heavens. He's giving him honor. He's, di- he's distinguishing lowercase g from a capital G. Because there's a lot of gods, but there's only one heavenly father. And I answered the king. If it 
pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried, buried so I can rebuild it. He gave him his request. Prayer came first. Let's see what the king responds. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him. Isn't it awesome when there's a king and there's a queen? It's cool, especially in the households, right? Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked, asked me, How long will your journey take? And when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me. So I set a time. It doesn't say a time. But the important thing is that the, the, the door was opened. And the king released him. And it all started with a prayer. I also said to him, if it please, see, now, now, now this, <laughs> Nehemiah is, is bright. He said, the door's open. Let me go on and ask for a couple more requests. Yeah. He started off with one request. But since you're in the refrigerator, Mom, um, can you also make me a sandwich? You ever heard that? You know, you're in the refrigerator getting one thing. Your kids are asking you for something. Else because, just because. Just because. Since you're going to the grocery store, can you bring me back a, a box of Cheerios? Everyone's sleeping? No one's smiling? Come on now. Or oh, is it me? Okay. So, he, it, it opened that door of communications, right? So, since I got the permission to go, I gave him the time frame when it should be completed. Um, so I'm good. So let me go and ask this, this other question, you know. So um, don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to ask. You know, in, in, in Genesis, in Exodus, God didn't say ask. He said take. <laughs> ask not, receive not. Don't be afraid to ask. The only thing they can say is no. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters? Letters to the governors of trans-Euphrates. Hey, I said that right. So, so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal park, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. Boy, he asked for a lot of things. And, and because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. So guess what, guys? It wasn't the king's doing. It was because the hand of Almighty God was with him. The king could not respond in a negative fashion. When God is in the in e equation, what seems that it can't be, trust me, church, trust me, family, it's called favor. We stand on those promises. If God with me, who's against me? Greater is he that is with me than that one that comes against me. You stand on those promises. Call on the name of the Lord and you and your household shall be saved. These are promises. These are things that we stand for because that's evidence of God's hand upon us. Not physically, but spiritually. For the Bible clearly tells us that faith is the substance of things that are hoped for, not seen by the eye. His hand is on you. You won't see it. For you will see the effects of the hand as the king's response to this godly man. You'll see the result. 
he told Nicodemus, Jesus told Nicodemus, when Nicodemus told, asked him about um, the heavenly things, he's, he says, you know, what's this thing, you know, about Jesus and being saved and the Holy Spirit and being, you know, um, reborn again? He says, listen, you, you, you're, you're a scholar. I'm telling you things that you don't understand, but let me explain to you this way. He says, do you see the wind? No. He says, do you see the effects of the wind? Of course. Of course. And that is God's hand on us. We don't see it. But we can see the evidence of that hand being with us. So he asked for two letters. And the one, both of those letters though, but there's the one in particular. Well, let's say them both because they both expanded his territory and assured his safety. That authority that he received by the king giving him a handwritten letter sealed went from being a cupbearer to being a Pastor Tim, an engineer, to being an architect, to expanding his horizon from one kingdom to Jerusalem. Your troubles might be an opportunity for God to expand what he's called you to do. Troubles doesn't necessarily mean that the enemy is against you. Troubles may mean that God is putting you in the press to produce juice, grape juice. There's a great possibility that your circumstance is to definitely receive a victory that you would have to give a sound of worship. Because the hand of God. <laughs> now, building is not just for intellects. I might not be qualified to build, but I know someone that can qualify me. He qualifies the unqualified. There's evidence. Moses said, God, who am I? I can't even... Talk right. I stutter. What he told him, I didn't call your inabilities. I didn't call your unqualified self. He says, I'm the man. I'm God. I'm qualifying you right now. Building in this situation, to repair the walls of Jerusalem. There were high priests. They went to work. There was families. There were silversmiths. There were sons. There was rulers. And there was daughters, too. We're all called to build. No, not build. Let's take that back. Restore what is crumbling. We're all called to restore in our own personal lives, first of all, because we crumble once in a while. We're called to rebuild, to restore in our families. We are called to restore even our neighbor's fences. But first, if you don't have, you can't give. See, we're all called to work. We're all called to labor. 
Matthews 9, 37, 8 is, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest. In other words, there are women, men and children, families that are waiting for us to help them restore what has been broken. That means all of us, not just me, all of us. And I'm sure that we all have circumstances and we feel pressures in different areas. I'm sure of it. I'm not the only one. Most of you know my current situation. I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one in the press. Because let me tell you, if you put one grape in one press, guess what you're going to get out of it? A drop. But if we're all symbolic to a bunch of grapes, we're going to get a great old big bottle of, of, of grape juice, Right? So I'm sure that all of us at some place in time or maybe presently along with me might be in the press right along with me. But guess what? We're going to produce some singing, folks. Yes? Amen? Okay, that should have been a shout right there. That's all right. I forgive you. We're all probably in that press together. And you know what? And my understanding is that in, in, in what we learned about bees, that th the way they can distinguish that group from another group is that they, they rub up against each other. And when they rub up against each other, they, they give away that scent of their honey. So they know who's who. And guess what? We smell like we're from the same group, church. And if we come together to make a difference, what I can't do alone, together, no matter what your position may be in society, I'm sure we can help build some walls. How many are with me so far? And as I said earlier, sometimes... You have to restore what's in your own backyard. Beyond then Benjamin and Hashab made repairs in front of their house. And next to them, Azariah, son of Messiah, the son of Ananiah, wow, made repairs beside his home. So in other words, they're all making repairs to the walls right in their own backyards. God is not asking us to go build in other countries sometimes. Go to your own backyards. Go to your neighbor's house. Go to your family's house. Stay in your own home, heck. And bring back to restoration that which God had allowed something to exist. God makes something out of nothing. So we go back to him to give us some direction. So going back to our backyards means going back, in my case, to the hood. And guess what? Yesterday, I did exactly that. Me and Pastor Tom. Look up there. We were in one of the most notorious drug corners in Philadelphia. We gave away over, we gave away 50 hot dogs in it. Probably less than an hour. Heroin users, prostitutes, people with AIDS. People in dire need. This is serious business. That's how we spent our morning. But two people can't do this. We only touched 50 people. There were many more hungry. We seen a girl not only eat one, she swallowed a second one. Somebody said, they're going to eat hot dogs in the morning. I said, these people are homeless. You see those buildings? That's where they live at. Oh. 
I had one gentleman say, listen, my wife, in Spanish, my wife is a heroin user, and she's laying in bed sick, and she doesn't have to eat. Can I please have another hot dog? I'm sure that most of us ate bacon and eggs yesterday. Or I had the capacity to go to McDonald's or Burger King or go in our office or into our neighbor's house, into our business place, and have something to eat. And we dare say we have none. We offend God. Because we are too busy wanting. And God has given us. How dare we say we don't have. Blessed be the name of the Lord. There's temporary setbacks. When you're in a mission from God, there are temporary setbacks. Because the objective of the enemy is to undo what God has called you to do. There are temporary setbacks, but the key word is temporary. Yeah. Nehemiah 4, 9, 11. And this is a foreword. This first, what he says here is a foreword of what occurred towards the end of these verses. That's a foreword. In other words, he's giving you the end first. But we prayed to our God because of them. Because of them. See, it has no significance. It's not telling me enough. Because of who? Why? We'll get the answer right now. And we had men watching for them day and night. So in Judah, it was said, those who carry the loads are becoming weaker, and there is much dust. We are not able to work on the wall. Discouragement. Those who hated us said they will not know it or see us until we are among them. Kill them and stop the work. The enemy was out to destroy them, to kill them. To assure that they never get to build that wall. But there was somebody praying. See, you might not have the guts to stand in that corner. Because let me tell you, it's a dangerous corner. Up the street from there, I sat with a girl where they slit her throat. Not everyone. I don't recommend everyone. I don't even want my wife there. I don't, I don't want, it's not for everyone. But you can do what they did. You can pray for us. You can give financially, give materials, give whatever it may be. You can give. You can pray. And if you feel God has called you to do that, join us. We're doing it once a month. I'll be there this Tuesday yet once again. Possibly next Saturday in the morning. Those who hated us. There are some folks that hate us. But God is greater. Go back to step one. Pray. Proverbs 24, 16. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. Hebrews 10, 35. I'm sorry. Don't give it up. Don't give up that confidence. When does it come up against us? Don't give up that confidence. Because it says in Proverbs 24, 16, for every man who is right with God falls seven times, seven times he will be risen up again. 
Don't give up the confidence. Don't give confidence because you come short of his glory. Don't give up the confidence because you see opposition. Don't give up the confidence because God has an opportunity to show himself to be God. Don't give up. This is the beauty of it all. And they did. Verse 16, Nehemiah 6. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elui. Elui? Well, I'm sounding like I'm speaking in tongues here. In 52 days, it was built in 52 days. I'm presuming that he gave the king a timeline. See, the king, the king needed his, he needed him, he trusted him. To give him that kind of power and, and that kind of release and letters, he had to have trust him. There's, 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 a, there's a, a, some bond there. He released him for a short period of time with the expectations of receiving him in return, for him to return back. It's reciprocal sometimes. You do for me, and I do for you. So there's a compromise. There's a compromise. This is the beauty of it. And this is what happens to the enemies. This is what happens to the enemy when he hears the news of how God Shows himself to be God. Verse 16. 6, 16. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. <laughs> Yeah, enemies would come down to their knees when they realize who's done it. And there's nothing less than God and God himself. Let us go before the Lord in prayer.